Kitty Rotman. Great to be with you, man. Good to be with you. And your new book, The Age of the Strongman. Mm -hmm. um, and their consolidation of power, their nationalism, um, and their ability to undermine the institutional structures and frameworks in the countries. G tell me what, of the structural factors that are making this happen, what's the one that you think is hardest to turn around? Well, I think probably the one that's hardest to turn around is, uh, how do I put it, mass migration. I think resentment at uh, minority groups is often a big pitch for these uh, strongman leaders. Um, it's, it's really striking that, uh, you know, obviously Trump, when he came in, was to sort of build a wall and even attempted to ban all Muslims from entering the United States. But that was the first thing he tried to do. Indeed. But if you look at, at Modi in India, uh, it's a very majoritarian, it's, it's Hindu nationalism, really, more than, even than Indian nationalism, and aimed to a considerable extent at the Muslim minority. Uh, there in, the, in China, you know, they've interned a million uh, Uyghurs. Uh, and again, it's a sort of majoritarian thing. And in Europe, I think a lot of the, the kind of far-right figures are campaigning on the idea that the nation is at risk because of social change and, and migration. And yet I think migration in mixed societies are kind of the way of the world and we all have to get used to it and, and learn to, um, you know, to, to look at the benefits of it. But there's a very sort of strong generation of strongman leaders who are finding it's a very fertile theme for them. Um, and so, you know, you could say inequality is another driver, but, but it's easier to think of, well, there are economic policies, adjustments you can make to make, I mean, it's hard, but, but you can imagine the policy adjustments that would deal with that set of resentments. But if you can demonize those people. Exactly. Right. Demonizing those people is kind of key for a lot of these strongman leaders. And those people aren't going anywhere unless you do something really kind of horrific, like a mass internment. Now, it's interesting that in the case of Ukraine, we are seeing these mass numbers of migrants coming into Europe and coming into countries that have some strong man leaders. Yeah. And that hasn't driven them, even though they're clearly outsiders, but the European outsiders. Yeah. Is that enough? Well, I think the European outsiders thing does matter. I mean, I think that people, you know, it's, it's pointless to deny that people are more likely to feel uh, compassion for people who maybe look a bit like them, whose, whose lives look a bit similar and so on. You know, even in London, we would watch the videos from, from Ukraine and say, boy, you know, their flats don't look so different from our flats. They're walking the dog like we are. It, it doesn't look like Yemen or Tigray, which seems that much further away. And I think it is, there is something human. I mean, why, why do they say the Arab world is particularly upset by the Palestinian issue more than the rest of the world? Because they feel their close, a closeness to them. So I don't think it's that surprising that uh, you know, if you're Poland, even if you've been very resentful or fearful of, of migrations of Muslims, which really isn't happening even in Poland, but but the Ukrainians are next door neighbors. Plus, I think they feel what's happening to them could happen to us. There's there's uh, a common sense of threat about Russia. One of the stats that always struck me, and I'm sure you've seen it, um, is when you ask Europeans how many Muslims actually are in your population, and the guesses are between five and sometimes twenty x. Sure. what the numbers actually are, because that demonization works so effectively in the politics. Absolutely. And, um, and I think, you know, in France, for example, actually, they, they don't even know because they, they, they don't, they don't, the census doesn't count doesn't them because, count them, because yeah. it's part of a sort of ideological thing. But yeah, absolutely. I, I think that people feed off anecdote and, um, and maybe, you know, in big cities, uh, the populations of immigrants of all sorts, Muslims and others, are quite visible and, and, and so on. But it was interesting, say, in the UK during the Brexit referendum, that the areas of the country that felt most strongly about immigration were probably the areas that had, had least of it. It was something that was going on in people's heads rather than, you know, London, which is a massively migrant city. I think now almost 40% of the population of London was born overseas. And if you count people like me whose parents were born overseas, you're getting up to 80%. It's extraordinary. But it voted very strongly to remain in the EU, which was the sort of pro-migration vote. Um, whereas areas that had had less migration were, were much more suspicious of it. Now, since we're talking about migration, of course, at some point, you get to a tipping point. In the United States, we expect the country demographically to become minority white by 2045. Now, a lot of people would presume that at some point, you just don't have the numbers anymore to continue a strongman policy that's focusing on aggravated, undereducated white men. 
Um, do you buy that? Do you think that this, this trajectory is just going to break at some point demographically? Well, uh, t specifically in the U.S.? Well, it would be nice to believe it, but I, I think that the Democrats may have put rather too much faith in that idea because um, it's, I mean, one of the interesting things is the growth of the Hispanic vote for, 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 for Trump. Trump. Exactly. And so a lot of um, his rhetoric about illegal migration might appeal to, to legal migrants, you know, who, who'd say, well, you know, I've come here legally or... And well, some I'm, of that I'm in Germany too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and in the UK, you yeah. know, I, uh, I speak to, you know, recent Indian migrants and so on who, who, who will say, well, you know, you can't have all these sort of illegal people coming in. So it's, it's a complicated issue. I mean, it's not, um, I think, a given that... Uh, that there won't be some minority support uh, for, for, for Trumpism. I mean, I think we're, we're actually seeing evidence to the contrary because provided it steers clear of pure racism, you know, overt racism, uh, and says that it's, you know, Americans first, the Americans who are here rather than the outsiders, I think that can appeal to recent migrants as well. And, and do you see this as fundamentally hand in glove with a fragmentation of globalization that will also continue? I think it's very closely related, yeah. Uh, because I think that, you know, a lot of these strongman appeals are, are sort of emotionally linked issues. So globalization and migration are not exactly the same thing, but they're, they're related and they're to do with a sense of loss of control of the nation, that we had this nation that kind of, to some extent, controlled its own destiny. And now it's part of this big globalized economy and jobs are being shipped away and disappearing and our borders are crumbling. That sort of emotionally it is of a piece. And so America First contains a migration element, but it also contains a very strong element of protectionism, saying, you know, bring, bring the jobs back, etc. And then if you look at some other things that are happening in the world that aren't strictly related to it, but that feed in, like, like the pandemic, which suddenly makes people focus on uh, the fragility of supply chains, and goodness, does it make total sense to have whatever, you know, I can't remember the precise stat, but 80% of our personal protective equipment made in, in China. So there's so the, those kinds of arguments are also coming in, plus the growing geopolitical rivalry where people begin to, even on the kind of liberal pro-globalization and in economics, begin to say it doesn't make sense to be this dependent on a country that may be an adversary. And we've seen with Russia that actually in economic relations which were built up, which we thought probably unbreakable. Um, the Europeans, fact, which the Europeans Absolutely, got. The yeah. Americans did not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually get broken by geopolitics. And so obviously people begin to think, well, might that, might that happen with China? Yeah. Interesting, of course, though, that that is only happening with the advanced industrial democracies in Russia. It's not happening at all with the developing countries in, in Russia, even though the, the, those features of nationalism, protectionism are found in those countries too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's one of the most interesting things about this crisis is that our initial assumption in the West was, whoopee, you know, we've united the world against Russia. And then you look around. No, you have. And no, you haven't. And actually, I mean, this stat that at the UN, 50% of the world's population did not vote. OK, I mean, that's partly because India and China are about 40%. Yeah. But but yeah, you know, significant countries that you would classify as Mexico, centrist democracies. Indonesia, Mexico, yeah. Brazil, South, South Africa. Africa. Yeah all abstaining. Yeah. And I think it's it's for complex reasons. I mean, but I, I'd point to a couple. I mean, one is that they will say, look, you're so horrified by what's happening in Ukraine, but, you know, America invaded Iraq. Uh, there was a lot of people killed there, you know, and there, there are other vi terrible violence going on that's not getting the headlines. So they'll say you're being a bit hypocritical. And, and there's some truth to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's not an easy argument to completely dismiss. Yeah. And they will also say, oh, and by the way, these sanctions that you're imposing will have a cost on us because it's raising the, the price of energy. The While price the Europeans of, still buy gas. The price of food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I think also there's a geopolitical thing that, that at some level they don't really want to go back to a unipolar world. So they think, um, you know, if the U.S. actually does effectively uh, crush Russia or cut them off from the world, then, you know, even if we don't approve of what Putin's doing, he's kind of another option in the way that China's another option. Yeah. And they think, well, maybe one day the U.S. will disapprove of us and they will do the same to us. So, Gideon, of the strong men leaders out there, who's the one that actually kind of appeals to you the most? Gosh, that is 
difficult. Um, I, I wouldn't say, I'm now running desperately through my head. I certainly don't like Putin for obvious reasons. I'll no, go no, through my, go, don't I'll go through my chronology. No, come on. No, I'm, gonna, I'm waiting for one to come up that I can think I can approve yeah, of. Putin, no. Erdogan, no. Erdogan is just, a friend of mine's just been in prison for 18 years. Well, that'll Erdogan. make you like him less. That's true. Yeah. I mean, no, uh, not the friend. I mean, Erdogan. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, she, I can't say I'm particularly fond of. Who are we getting to? Modi, I think, is an interesting figure. I mean, I, I, I actually increasingly think he's a sinister figure, but but you can you can make a case that you know he is elected, he is genuinely popular, he is uh, try, uh, trying to kind of mobilize a sense that India's on the move, is modernized, and and so on. And he hasn't done the kind of worst fears about Modi have not yet been realized. You know there hasn't been mass communal violence or mass imprisonment, although people are, are, are concerned about it. But I think he's had a pretty negative effect on media freedom, you know, people are a little worried about the courts in India. So it's hard to say he's entirely positive. But uh, Boris Johnson, I was attacked for including in the book. And it was a slightly marginal call. But I think Brexit and Trump are linked phenomena. So I had to sort of, I felt that, that you had to kind of discuss it. Bolsonaro is a kind of a bit of a joke, really. I, it's hard to say. So Modi's the one that potentially appeals to you. Though. Yeah, but I wouldn't I wouldn't say even that. Because he's standing up for India because on the global stage because his economic policies have been more successful. What what is it that you where is it that you'd give him credit? Where is it that you'd say, yeah, I kind of get that. Look, you know, I mean, as I say, I'm not a fan of the guy. No, I but, get but, it. But I think but that... no one's the villain of their own story, right? And so, I mean, when you write a book like this, you want to try to understand oh, yeah. the narrative. And when you do that, sometimes you say, "Okay, I see that," or "Yeah, that kind of okay." That resonates I, mean, I, I with think me. another thing you could say about Modi, and one of the reasons that he's popular, and actually one of the reasons why I think I mistakenly said in 2014 he's worth he was worth a try, and I now slightly regret having said that. But actually. Even Obama said that, you know, 2015 was writing essays about what a great guy. And said we should let him in and, you yeah, know, remember, totally. because he was on the blacklist. And then they said, no, 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 we're going to give him a yeah, visa. And, and, and said, you know, he, I think he said something like he represents the promise of a new India and yep. all that. And I think the fact that he has come from genuinely humble background is... In, he isn't corrupt. Yeah. Personally. He, is, he isn't personally corrupt. Um, and also, you know, there was something a little odd that, you know, in this country of 1.3 billion people... That the ruling elite was was seen to be such a narrow group of people, and I think that he's an unusual Indian leader. That he's genuinely come from the lower middle class, uh, and he obviously has a rapport with huge numbers of Indians. And I think that one of the arguments you can make about populism and uh, and the relationship of strongman leaders to populism is that people like me can sort of say effectively, "This is sinful. You know, you shouldn't go anywhere near it." But they are actually identifying. Real, real demands, real grievance. Absolutely, and they, and they are often right that the globalist elite, of which the two of us are epitomise, um, are out of touch. You know, they 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 they, they get something. I mean, you know, so it was interesting ahead of the French election, where you know people thought Le Pen might be the first female strong woman, and I was talking to a French political analyst uh, who, again, is not going to vote for Le Pen, but he said. Look, the, the far right has been building and building and building in France over 20, 30 years. And, and maybe, did again in the last yeah, election. And it, and yeah, and it's keep going. And he said, uh, you know, maybe in a democratic system, ultimately, they have to be given a try. Um, I'm not sure I agree, because I think that if they give, get given a try, they you may not get another damage, try. You know, yeah. you know, so, but that is an argument that th these... Uh, these leaders often are popular, and you've got to ask yourself why. Well, there's another argument, of course, which is that um, if you see these movements growing as a responsible leader that believes in rule of law, if you don't do anything and take the bold, courageous, maybe steps that will get you voted out mm. to actually start providing for disenfranchised people in your country, yeah. then you are ultimately responsible for the rise of the strongman. Yeah, no, and I, I think that, you know, democratic or liberal leaders face a series of dilemmas about what parts of these agenda can, should, should I actually try to deal with, you know, and appropriate and so on. You can see it on migration where countries like Australia and Denmark, for example, have adopted very draconian migration policies that, uh, you know, would have appalled liberal opinion 10, 15 years ago and, and do still to some extent. But I think because they said, well, this is what our populations want. And if we don't do it, somebody else, some more extreme, will, will, will take up the banner. So the Danish government 
you know, has adopted quite a lot of the policies that used to be labeled far right. Biden well, on immigration. Yeah, well, absolutely. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, family breakups still going on. Yeah. We saw what happened to Merkel. Yeah. On yeah. that issue. Well, actually, she did survive, um, but 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 it was the biggest hit she took. Oh, totally. And and you know the the subsequent election, I remember talking to officials of her, and they said the atmosphere of her rallies was so ugly. You know that you often couldn't hear her speak because of the sort of anti Merkel chanting in the background. Gideon Rajman, the book is "The Age of the Strong Man," and uh, it's just out. Good to see you, man. Thank you very much, Ian.